The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon, and welcome to our first Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I'm John Jackson, and I will serve as the Master of Ceremonies for today's event. I'd like to note that there are a few of us enthusiastic here in the building, and also a large group in uh, online with Zoom, and we welcome uh, both groups. To open our session, I'd like to turn the microphone over to our new provost, Dr. Stephen Mariano, for his welcoming remarks. Provost? Uh, thank you, John, um, and welcome everyone. Yes, I'm Stephen Mariano. I'm the new uh, provost here at the Naval War College, and on behalf of uh, Admiral Chatfield, who's currently traveling, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening, and also welcome David Skull. Thank you very much for being here. Um, every day, our students uh, have the opportunity to hear from world-class scholars and study the most pressing security issues of the past, present, and even future. In short, we wanted to provide all of you with a similar opportunity. Consequently, the purpose of the Issues in National Security Lecture Series is to provide intellectual stimulation to the broader Naval War College community, opportunities to those of you that might not be able to attend our academic programs. What started as a program for spouses and significant others has grown because it became so popular. We enlarge it to audiences throughout the community, to the staff and other employees across the base. We hope that these lectures give the participants a taste of what's on, what the students receive every day. And so today you'll see the first offering on the menu for the 2022-2023 year. We kick off the series with one of our most knowledgeable speakers, Professor John Maurer who will introduce us all to the brilliant work by one of our founding fathers, Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan. One simply cannot understand the US Navy or naval power in general without understanding a bit about Mahan, or is it Mahan? Now I'm a retired army officer, so it's my duty to point out that Admiral Mahan was the son of Dennis Hart Mahan, who I'm sure we'll probably hear a little bit about, who's a celebrated military theorist, civil engineer and professor, at the United States Military Academy at West Point from 1824 to 1871. But regardless of your affiliation, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coastie, government civilian, international fellow, faculty, staff, intern, or spouse, we hope you enjoy the talk this evening and continue to talk about it and the other lectures throughout the year long after they're over and long after the Q&A sessions are finished. So thank you all for attending. And I'd like to give my personal thanks to the Johns, Jackson and Maurer. We appreciate it and uh, have a good evening. Over the 2022-2023 academic year, we will be offering 16 lectures from some of the best scholars in the world folks here on our resident faculty. This is intended to share a portion of the experience as the provost has explained, so that you have a feel for what the students are being exposed to. And I've challenged several of you already to take notes and then go home and ask your student if they know that fact. Uh, I like to stir up the pot whenever possible. So we do include uh, spouses, significant others, War College Foundation members, international sponsors, and people from around the world who watch us via Zoom, and we're very pleased to, uh, to have that happen. So this is the uh, schedule, and uh, it's an eye test, so I won't attempt to uh, go through all of it, but uh, normally we're on Tuesday afternoons. Uh, the next one will be Space and National Security, uh, Professor Burbach. And it may very well be that the Artemis I mission, which is an unmanned mission going around the moon, will take place before that lecture, or it could get postponed again. Either way, uh, we will talk about space and uh, national security. 
Uh, the uh, conflict in Ukraine obviously is uh, critically important to all of us. We'll be talking about that, uh, global climate, et cetera. Then we'll take the winter break, come back. Uh, we're going to talk about humans versus machines, Professor Tim Schultz. Uh, we'll talk about the Arctic, uh, a number of other system, uh, issues, China, women, peace, and security. I will do my drone pitch, One Nation Under Drones, Indivisible with Liberty and Justice for All. And then we'll have a final two uh, uh, sessions after the spring break and then wrap it up with a season finale. So it's a, a great opportunity for people to learn. We will not give you any academic credit. However, we will award certificates of participation for those who attend 70% of the lectures. That's 11 out of the 16. So uh, keep track of the ones you attend. Uh, and if you'd be interested in getting that certificate, we'll uh, make that possible for you towards the end. So after today's discussion, we'll take about a five minute break and then we'll reconvene for the family discussion group discussions. And uh, we will do these most weeks where we'll have people from Naval Station Newport and other support organizations brief uh, all of you on issues of concern. We're going to talk about schools and other sources today. So uh, if you'd like to stay on, uh, please feel free to do that. Okay, on to the main event. During the presentation that follows, our virtual participants should feel free to ask questions using the chat function on Zoom. And we'll recognize uh, questions here in the audience, and then we'll also take questions from our virtual participants. We ask that you use the microphone that's in front of your chairs if you're gonna ask a question so everyone can hear you and our virtual participants can hear as well. This evening lecture will introduce you to one of the most important officers in US Naval history. Alfred there, Mahan, I never can get that, served as the second president of the Naval War College. An officer in the United States Navy, he fought in the American Civil War and held commands both at sea and ashore during his long professional naval career. The college's founder, Admiral Stephen B. Luce, brought Mahan to Newport to serve on the faculty and present lectures on strategy and naval history. He subsequently turned these lectures into best-selling books on the influence of sea power upon history. These histories are widely considered the most influential work of nonfiction written by an American author during the 19th century. In addition to his histories, Mahan wrote extensively about international rivalries of his day involving the great powers. Professor Maurer will briefly examine Mahan's writings about world politics and great power strategic competition, drawing out parallels that exist between his era and our own times. Professor John Maurer serves as the Alfred Thayer Mahan Distinguished University Professor of Sea Power and Grand Strategy. At the college, he previously served as chair of the Strategy and Policy Department. The author and editor of numerous books and articles, his next book coming out next month from the U.S. Naval Institute Press is entitled The Road to Pearl Harbor, Great Power War in Asia and the Pacific. I'm pleased to pass the podium to one of the most smart, one of the smartest and most eloquent speakers, which I am not, Professor John Mauer. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to speak as John said, about Alfred Thayer Mahan. That's the correct pronunciation. He told people that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, Mahan uh, was the second president here at the Naval War College. His books and articles uh, achieved for him an international standing, recognized as a writer on history, he was president of the American Historical Association. His books on history also garnered for him honorary degrees from major universities around the world, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, again, recognized as a great historian. But he also, also wrote about international affairs and world politics. His articles 
is articles on international strategic matters were sought after by the public and also by leaders. So today I'm going to talk about the time in which Mahan lived, the Navy in which he served, the country, the United States place in world affairs, and also the international environment of his time. Well, the influence of sea power upon history, published in 1890 by the Boston firm Little Brown. It's important to note that this book started as lectures here at the Naval War College for students in the old schoolhouse across the way, now the Museum of the Naval War College. Uh, by the way, Mahan tried to peddle this book to several publishers who turned him down. He was frustrated by that. I've never had any of my books turned down, so I have never had that experience. Not true. I just lied to you on stage. Uh, anyway, he was frustrated by this. And in fact, he almost gave up in the attempt to publish his book. Uh, but instead, he persevered. And eventually, the publishing house of Little Brown took up uh, uh, the publication of his book. They took a risk there. Wow, did they do well in signing Mahan. The book became an international bestseller and has been in print ever since. Again, one of the marks of a classic book, if you remember, from your high school teachers, is what, stand, what makes a book a classic, a work of art, a class. It has withstood the test of time. Just think about that, 1890 to our own time. Mahan's books are still in print and read. Well, what's the influence of sea power about? The first sentence of the book lays out what the story of sea power is about. It's largely, as he says, a contest among great powers, rivalries, ending in violence, culminating in war, this is a very stark, stark uh, view of international relations, that countries are destined, almost inevitable, to become rivals of each other, that the international system is marked by these intense rivalries that lead to war. Again, this stark view of international relations is one that we would like to avert our gaze and say it can't possibly be these struggles for power. Won't, won't occur. Again, at the end of the 19th century, when he was writing, many pointed and said, great power war, it's impossible. The world economy is too knit together. War between great powers would be economic suicide. The victors will not come out of such a struggle even better and better in any way than those that have lost the struggle. Mahan is taking a stand against that. He's saying that ancient rivalries, wars from the ancient world, the ancient Greeks, Thucydides, these will be played out again into the future. His books are meant to be a warning, a warning about the dangers in the international environment. And so the very first sentence of the influence of sea power really grabs you, gets your attention right up front, that that's the story he has to tell a story of war, of rivalry, of international jealousies. Well, what about the college where he came to be professor of strategy and second president? Well, its founder was Stephen B. Luce, uh, noted, noted uh, exemplary officer in the Navy of his time, served in the Civil War. While in the Civil War, he, uh, to part a number of campaigns, but one campaign was to work with General Sherman as Sherman marched through the South, through Georgia, and then up North through the Carolinas. Luce would hold conversations with Sherman. He was so impressed by General Sherman. Sherman could outline the history of the future. He could tell how operations were going to unfold. He predicted almost to the day when the Confederate fortress city of Charleston would fall. Luce was so impressed by Sherman and his knowledge of operations and strategy that he thought that anyone who is in the service of the armed forces needs to have that education, be able to be like Sherman, able to predict, to see the history of the future. 
Well, that is one of the motivations that he had for establishing the Naval War College, which as he wrote, said, should be a place for the study of war, statesmanship related to the prevention of war. Again, we would call this as a place to study war, but also questions of international relations as well. Well, he brought Mahan to be the professor of strategy here and assigned to him to deliver lectures. And so Mahan spent a year in New York City uh, using libraries to put together his lectures that eventually became his books on the influence of sea power. Now, one of the reasons why Luce chose Mahan to come here to be a professor of strategy uh, was because Mahan already had a reputation in the service as being an intellectual officer. He had already published a book about the US Navy in the American Civil War, a book called The Gulf and Inland Waters. He had also written an article for the US Naval Institute Proceedings about naval education, the role of education for a naval officer. But another factor, as was highlighted by the provost, was that his father was a celebrated, legendary professor of engineering, but also we would say uh, operations and tactics. Many of the Civil War generals studied operations under Dennis Hart Mahan. And so Luce looked at the younger Mahan and thought he's going to be for the Navy like his father had been for the Army, that educator of Sherman and Grant. Um, Mahan himself in his autobiography said that no doubt he was chosen because it was hoped that some of his father's ability to be a great teacher would rub off on him. Well, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, the first volume came out in 1890. And as mentioned, Mahan already had a long uh, service career. He graduated from the Naval Academy right on the eve of the American Civil War and was thrust right into the operations of the American Civil War. So he saw war firsthand. Well, what are some of his teachings on strategy? Well, it's important that Mahan wanted to highlight the importance of strategy. He called strategy what? The queen of military sciences. He highlighted in his writings and his lectures, he said that this is what determines, strategy determines the outcome, the outcome of war. A country, armed services can win battles and yet still lose the war if the strategy isn't sound. And he wanted to highlight that to the officers that he was educating. The fundamental importance of strategy uh, and indeed the college's reputation since Mahan's time to the present day rests on the education strategy that we offer here. Well, the book was right away a sensation uh, in the United States and around the world. One of the first reviewers was Theodore Roosevelt, future president of the United States. Look what he wrote, distinctively the best, most important, and by far the most interesting book on naval history, produced in many a long year. Again, what does Mahan show? The practical importance of the study of naval history. It's not naval history for its own sake. It's for the application of history to understand better current affairs, current problems. And again, Roosevelt is highlighting that, the wish to estimate and use aright the navies of the present. Again, Mahan is a historian, but he's also trying to instruct, instruct those students in his charge, those that read his books, about the importance of history for understanding today's problems. Well, uh, Theodore Roosevelt wasn't the only person to be taken by Mahan's books. Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany read the books. Kaiser Wilhelm was the grandson of Queen Victoria of Britain. Uh, he spoke English uh, fluently. Uh, he uh, told an American correspondent friend of his that he's not just reading the hand, but he's just devouring it. The book is that good. He's trying to learn it by heart. 
Uh, again, here at the Naval War College, we want our students to learn the hand by heart. Again, it's a first class work, he says, in all of its points. It's has it translated into German and it's aboard all of his ships. And again, his captains and officers are constantly quoting it, he says, to his American correspondent. By the way, over in the museum, there is a copy of the influence of sea power upon history, the German translation uh, over in the uh, museum. I urge you all to go over to the museum to get a sense of the college's history, but you can also look at this translated volume of Mahan's work. Again, Wilhelm, Wilhelm of Germany, the emperor, was very much taken by Mahan's work. But it's not just Mahan's generation that generation of Theodore Roosevelt and Kaiser Wilhelm, but also a younger generation as well who read Mahan. You can see Winston Churchill on the right there. This is from August 1941, a summit meeting off the coast of Newfoundland, uh, the Atlantic Conference, just as the US is emerging, getting ready to emerge into the Second World War. President Roosevelt had a meeting with Winston Churchill Winston Churchill was a reader of Mahan. He actually met Mahan in 1911 when he was first Lord of the Admiralty and told Mahan that he was reading his latest book on naval strategy. Uh, we know this because Mahan wrote to his publisher of that book, Naval Strategy, and said, the first Lord of the Admiral is reading my book. Uh, it must be really important. How about that? Uh, Churchill later in life would say, there is no greater thinker on naval strategy than Mahan. Another person who read Mahan though, was Franklin D. Roosevelt, the future president of the United States during the Second World War. You cannot understand Churchill and Roosevelt's strategy in the Second World War without understanding the influence of Mahan upon history. Uh, Roosevelt, as a boy, as a teenager, was a given a copy of Mahan's influence of sea power upon history as a present from his mother. He was smitten. He loved the book. He read everything that Mahan wrote. If you're looking for Christmas presents for your children or birthday presents, you can give them a copy of Mahan's works. Uh, Roosevelt, by the way, uh, wanted to put together a collected a collection of Mahan's writings and edit them. That was one of the, um, uh, goals he had set for himself when he was no longer president. After Roosevelt passed away, his wife Eleanor was asked by a journalist, what, what books did your husband read? What books were most influential in shaping his intellectual map? And without missing a beat, Eleanor Roosevelt said he was always quoting and talking about Alfred Thayer Mahan. Again, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was a close student, and as you'll see in a moment, uh, also corresponded with Mahan. But behind these two great political leaders, you see two naval officers. On the right, Admiral Harold Betty, nicknamed Stark, Chief of Naval Operations at this time, uh, Naval War College Class of 1923, where he read Mahan. And you can go to the archives, you can see his strategy uh, and policy paper. And in that, you can see where he quotes Mahan. Next to him, Admiral Ernest J. King, who would take over as chief of naval operations during the Second World War. Uh, naval War College class of 1933. Again, you can look at his strategy paper where he quotes Mahan. Uh, again, these officers in residence here who would be the great naval leaders of the Second World War, they studied Mahan. Well, what about the Navy of Mahan's time? Talk about the college and its influence on future leaders. What about the Navy? Well, this is 1893. This is the frontline strength of the Navy, a squadron of cruisers going off to European waters to show the American flag. And the flagship is the cruiser USS Chicago. Mahan was tasked to be the captain of the Chicago, the flagship of the squadron. Uh, 
Mahan didn't want to go. He wanted to stay here at the Naval War College and continue his pursuits of writing. By the way, his writings were quite lucrative to him. And if you look at Mahan's papers, you see he could count every penny that came in. He was very much interested in royalties. Well, he didn't want to go to, um, to go off to Europe to uh, uh, be captain of the Chicago. But he was told by the head of Navy personnel, Commodore Ramsey, it's not the business of a naval officer to write books. Naval officers go to sea. Mahan in his autobiography said he resented this, but he agreed. <laughs> it was the duty of naval officers to go to sea. And so he went to sea as the flag captain of the squadron aboard the Chicago. Well, the admiral of the squadron, Admiral Urban, a famous naval uh, hero of the American Civil War, uh, he and Mahan did not get along, and Urban wrote a fitness report of Captain Mahan, and this is some extracts from it. Mahan's interests are entirely outside, and he cares but little for the Navy. I asked my students, would you like to have this as your fitness report? He's not a good naval officer. Again, not observant with regard to the ship's welfare or appearance. And he doesn't inspire confidence in any way. In fact, the first few weeks of the Chicago's cruise, positively discreditable. The hands interest in the service, literary work. Oh my goodness, the hands a geek. He's a geek. Yeah, he's not really interested in the service in any other way. Uh, by the way, Mahan bitterly resented this fitness report that he was given and contested it. Well, Mahan and the college, their reputation rest together. By the early 1890s, the college had been around for almost a decade. And some of the Navy's uniform leadership said the college was a good experiment. Loose set up something, but it's not worth the resources that are being spent upon it. What do officers do during their year in residence at Newport? Well, they go to the casinos off Bellevue Avenue. They have a good time, but, but they really don't learn anything of importance. Again, Commodore Ramsey's view is that you should be at sea with ships, not on land studying history. Well, they went to the Secretary of the Navy, Hillary Herbert, and convinced him that the Naval War College should be closed down. A worthy experiment, gave it a shot, but ended. Well, Herbert uh, aborted a steamship to go from Washington up to Newport with the intention of closing down the college. As he was leaving Washington, one of his aides handed him the influence of sea power upon history and said, sir, read this. So while traveling, steaming north to Newport, he read the influence of sea power upon history. This is what he wrote to Mahan in 1893. This book is worth all the money that has been spent on the Naval War College. Changed Herbert's mind. He intended to abolish the college when he left Washington. But now he's going to do all in his power to sustain it. One of the definitions of power is to change somebody's mind. They want to do one thing, and you convince them to do something opposite from what they wanted to do. That's real influence. That's real power. This is a case of the power of words, of Mahan's writings. Uh, it is also, no doubt, the case, too, that the Secretary of the Navy was reading the reviews that were coming out about Mahan's works. And also that Mahan aboard the Chicago on the European tour, he was being fated by everyone. He met Kaiser Wilhelm. He met Queen Victoria. He met the Prime Minister of Great Britain. They all were acclaiming him as a great writer. With publicity like that, the Secretary of the Navy, no doubt, not just reading the books, but seeing that Mahan's work was striking a responsive chord. There was something to it. And again, it was a product of the Naval War College. So the college has survived down to our own day.
What about the nation, the United States of America in Mahan's time? Well, first, again, recognize it's the aftermath of the American Civil War, the bloodiest war in American history. Here's a painting of the Battle of Spotsylvania, the blue against the gray, the North against the South, the Union against the Confederacy. Horrific struggle marked by some new technologies, ironclads, the Monitor and the Virginia fighting off Hampton Roads, showing that the future was going to be with iron and steel, not wood. A famous painting, uh, Making Peace, that hangs in the White House. It shows President Lincoln meeting with his top generals, Grant and Sherman, toward the end of the war, and Admiral David Dixon there. Again, we would call this joint operations, the final campaigns of the war, how to bring this war to an end. You see in this beautiful painting there, the rainbow, the promise of the future, that what has stricken the United States in this civil war won't ever happen again. What a beautiful painting it is. And Lincoln listening to his generals and admiral about how to conclude what we would call war termination, bring an end to operations. Well, another painting, General Lee, the famous general of the Confederacy, the best general, surrendering to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in April, 1865. Again, the generation that Mahan lived through the horror of the American Civil War. In the aftermath of the war, how do you bring the country together? The country is now united again by war. It is the United States of America, united. Strong central institutions are needed to keep this country together, not have it break apart in political polarization. Well, in addition to that, how do you economically knit together the country? So you have great infrastructure uh, projects like the building of the railways across the uh, United States, linking together the country economically as well as war has linked it together politically. Here you see a famous work of art from 1872 by John Gast of Brooklyn. It shows Columbia, the female personification of America, America's manifest destiny. She's traveling across the country from east to west, from the ports, the cities. You can see the railways being built, uniting the country together. You can see too, what is she doing? She's laying the internet there with cable. And in her hand, she has a school book. Yes, information is going around, being transported across the country. But to make sense of that information, you have to have educated people. Again, public education is so important for educating a populace to understand the environment in which they live. Again, education is part of uniting the country together. Again, this is a sense that America recovering from the Civil War has that destiny, that great future ahead of it. Well, to understand a time, it's useful to look at the music of the time. What are people singing? Well, we didn't have an official national anthem in Mahan's time. That only comes in the 1930s with the Star Spangled Banner. At this time, the most popular patriotic song is Columbia, the gem of the ocean. And so join with me now as we sing the verses of Columbia, the gem of the ocean. Oh, Columbia, the gem of the ocean. You're not singing. Oh, well, again, look at the words here. Uh, again, the red, white, and blue. Banners make tyranny tremble, an ideological aspect to American life. And again, these banners, again, the country has gone through a storm, but now there's victory adorning Columbia. And again, that flag proudly floating before her. The union, the union forever. The country's knit together. Again, uh, Army and Navy forever. Three cheers for the red, white, and blue. Uh, we don't hear this uh, song as much anymore, do we, John? Sometimes we do, and the band will play it, but 
But again, it's not as popular as it was in its own time. And again, this really does take you back to an earlier time of American history. Again, a sense of confidence, belief in our flag. Well, behind those sentiments, there are realities of power. The United States is becoming a great industrial nation. And here you see a painting of the Bethlehem Steelworks, one of the biggest steel uh, plants in the world. The Bethlehem steel plant produces more steel than the whole, all of British steel plants in the United Kingdom. Just one factory. The United States is growing as a great industrial power already, a great, uh, as the railroads are opening up the lands of the Midwest, uh, a great agricultural power, producing surpluses of grain to export around the world, but also becoming a great industrial power as well at this time. Uh, Paul Kennedy, the Yale historian, and here's a photograph of him when he was at the current strategy forum here a few years ago on the stage right here of Spruance Auditorium in his famous classic book, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. He gives measures of economic strength of the great powers. And here's one of his tables. Uh, it's about energy consumption. How much energy does a country produce and consume in a year? That is one measure of a country's industrial strength. And what you see is that at the time of Mahan's publication of the influence of sea power upon history, the United States is moving past Britain as the world's leading industrial power. Britain was the pioneer of the Industrial Revolution, the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. Britons like to boast that they were the workshop of the world. Well, now the United States is emerging as a great industrial power on par with the workshop of the world. But fast forward a bit. On the eve of the First World War, what you see is that the United States, its economy, its industry is greater than the industry of Britain and Germany combined. Before the First World War, by the beginning of the 20th century, over 100 years ago, the United States is already an economic superpower. The United States position in the world has been undergirded by American economic strength from the beginning of the 20th century down to our own time. The United States has this powerful industrial, agricultural, technological uh, economy that makes it world-class, a world leader. We don't have military forces of the first rank, but we are certainly the leading economic power in the world by the time of the First World War. At the same time that Mahan's books on the influence of sea power are coming out to showcase America's industry and technology, there is the Great Columbian Exhibition of 1893 in Chicago. And here's a painting of this World's Fair that was put on in Chicago. Here's a photograph inside the main hall where you see American industry being trumpeted. General Electric, Westinghouse, Tesla, all there, all there, being shown to the world. The United States has emerged as an industrial giant along with Britain at this time. Again, this coincides with Mahan's book on the influence of sea power upon history. Well, at this great exhibition, a historian by the name of Frederick Jackson Turner delivered a paper that is famous about the closing of the frontier. In it, this is a so-called closing the frontier thesis, which is that from the time of Columbus down to 1893, well, there's been four centuries of the new world being colonized, developed, and a hundred years from the time of the constitution, but now the frontier is gone. The country's been knit together, but there's no more land to expand. A period of American history, Turner says, is ending in the 1890s. Again, it coincides the Turner thesis, the closing of the frontier with Mahan's writings on the influence of sea power upon history. By the way, the world recognizes that the United States is this great economic power. 
at the time of the Columbian exhibition, the two leading world powers, Britain and France, upgrade their diplomatic legations in Washington to full embassies. For the first time, Britain and France recognize the United States as an equal, an equal that deserves an embassy, a full embassy. Well, the 48, what next with the closing of the frontier? Well, Mahan gives the answer. Whether Americans want to or not, they have to look outward because the United States is so strong as an economic power. We're influencing the rest of the world. The growing economic production of the country demands that the United States have a more global view of the world. The United States is too important of a player, a player. It is caught up in the whole global environment. Well, this was a period of rising great power tensions uh, and competition. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, the leading world power at the time was Great Britain, the British Empire. Uh, Britain rested its position in the world as a world leader, rested on its economy. You see a gold sovereign there with Britannia, the female personification of Britain, sitting, the trident symbol of dominance at sea in her hand, uh, an olive branch, peace, peace through strength. And beside, behind her, what do you see? A warship, a British man of war. In 1897, at the Jubilee for Queen Victoria, her yacht went by a line of battleships. Economic power, naval power together, what Mahan calls sea power rule Britannia. But at the beginning of the 20th century, Britain is being challenged by other rising great powers. Again, here's Britain's position uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. One quarter of the world's landmass, one quarter of the world's population is governed by Britain. The home islands, the great dominion to the north in Canada. When you look at the British Empire, it stretches from New Zealand, Australia, Holdings, court and holdings in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Asia, all the way down to South Africa. In many ways, the British Empire is an Indian Ocean littoral empire. That in population is where the center of gravity is. Britain is the greatest power in Asia at the beginning of the 20th century. Well, who are the rising challengers? Well, here's a photograph that shows the two most important challengers for world power to Britain. Theodore Roosevelt and Kaiser Wilhelm, both these avid readers of Alfred Thayer Mahan. This is a photograph taken by the Kaiser's court photographer of German army maneuvers in 1910. And you see Theodore Roosevelt and the Kaiser on horseback in conversation. The Kaiser's photographer took these photographs and then sent them to pre uh, uh, to. President Roosevelt, who had just left office. This is 1910, a year after he has left office in 1909. Uh, President Roosevelt won the Nobel Peace Prize for helping to settle the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, a case study that we study in the intermediate level course here at the Naval War College. Well, after he left the presidency, he went to Europe to accept the prize, but also went on a lecture tour in France and in Germany. And while in Germany, the Kaiser said, come to my German army maneuvers in May of 1910. Well, here's another photograph. And here's the caption. Wilhelm, the Colonel of the Rough Riders, lecturing the chief of the German army. That's the Kaiser's hand, by the way that he's written underneath this photograph that he sends to former President Roosevelt. Here's another photograph. You can see the black armband on the Kaiser because his uncle, Edward VII, had passed away. Today, of course, the funeral for Queen Elizabeth uh, II. Uh, uh, here's the caption underneath. Can you read that? I know, pity the historians. We have to read the handwriting. Again, the Kaiser is fluent in English. Well, here's what he wrote. 
total agreement about the general maxims of life and policy between America, spelled with a K, and Germany. This is what he's writing to Roosevelt. But we know that this is wrong. There is no total agreement about general maxims in life and policy between these two rising great powers. These two rising great powers will become bitter enemies and fight two world wars against each other. Again, Mahan writing in his time about changes in power balances writing to war. What he writes about is the rise of German power and the threat that this poses to Britain and in the long run, if Germany is successful, to the United States as well. Well, Mahan, he was an advocate of a big Navy. Why? Well, the United States in his view is like Britain. It's an insular country. It's surrounded by major bodies of water, the Atlantic and the Pacific. So it's in the interest of Americans to understand the importance of the Navy. Our position in the new world as an island state demands that we have a powerful Navy to protect us. Again, what, is, what are the seas like? Well, in a very famous passage, uh, Mahan says, when you look at the seas, you have to think of it as one, a great highway, a wide common. Today, strategists talk a great deal about the commons, the maritime commons, the aerospace commons, information domain. Uh, a great power has to dominate these domains, these commons. If they don't, if they don't, they'll be losers in war. And again, you have to combine your strengths in different domains to get full strategic effects. Again, that the seas are a wide common, a great highway. And hence, how do you get the United States? The Atlantic Pacific can be a highway for invasion. Um, how do you come to dominate the, uh, the maritime, the sea common? Well, that command of the sea equals what Mahan calls an overbearing power on the sea. Uh, in wartime, you want to drive the enemy's flag away. The enemy can't appear on the seas except as a fugitive. You have such command, such dominance, not 100%, but so much that when the enemy does come out onto the seas, they're only coming out as a fugitive. And again, controlling what he calls the great common, to close that highway to your opponents. That's the goal of a Navy in wartime, to close that highway, that common, uh, to your adversary. And also control it in such a way that you can use it for whatever purposes you have in mind. Well, from a hand to the American people, it is every danger that the United States faces can be best met out there, over there, at sea. You need to have a powerful Navy to keep war's dangers as far away as you can. President Bush the Younger he liked to say that he wanted America's wars to be away games, not home games. Well, that's what Mahan is talking about as well. And again, a cartoon of the time. Now, Columbia, garbed as the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty, she's protected. Our hemisphere, our country is protected. And what is protected in? A fleet of battleships, first-class Navy. That's what you need to protect yourself in this world against envious other great powers. They can see that powerful Navy there. It will deter them from challenging you. The way to protect the new world from the old is to have that powerful Navy. Again, the caption, let it be written so it can be read. How do you want to write it? In steel, firepower, a powerful fleet. Mahan, Teacher or propagandist? Well, of course, that's a false dichotomy, false question. He's both. He is a teacher educating students here at the War College, but also wider audiences, the American public and leaders as well. He wants to reach a wider audience. And he is a propagandist. In fact, he's often thought to be one of the most successful propagandists that the United States has ever had arguing for a larger role for the United States in the world, 
And also, to go along with that, you need to have a powerful Navy. If you want to be a world power, you have to have a powerful Navy. Well, Mahan wasn't sure the American people were ready for this. And this is why he is a propagandist trying to educate the public. He said that a peaceful economic gain loving is not visionary. They can't see the dangers that are out there. They're content making money, doing well. But vision, that's what's required for adequate military preparation. Yeah, there might be no danger now, but it's out there on the horizon. These changing power balances can lead to war. Kaiser's Germany is getting stronger. It's building up its Navy. It is a threat to the existing international order. Again, popular governments, democracies, we would say. They're not generally favorable in peacetime, however necessary. Democracies declare war and then prepare for war rather than prepare for war and avert or deter war. Mahan was a firm believer in the old Roman adage that if you want peace, prepare for war. Well, one of the persons who corresponded with Mahan was Franklin D. Roosevelt a young Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, the number two civilian position in the Navy during the administration of Woodrow Wilson. Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted Mahan, this influential writer on policy affairs, to write about the need to keep the United States fleet concentrated before the Panama Canal was built. So Roosevelt wrote to Mahan, and asked him to write articles about the importance of keeping the Navy concentrated in peacetime to deter potential adversaries. Uh, again, what did Roosevelt write to Mahan? He says, your voice carries more conviction with the public and leaders than anyone else at this time. This is in 1913-14, on the eve of the Great War. Well, so what? What does this mean for us today? What does it mean for us today? These stories that Mahan told about great powers fighting in the 18th and early 19th century. How does that work for us today? What can we learn from that, from his histories of the influence of sea power? Well, Mahan is read today in China, where Chinese leaders, officers, are very much under the influence. Uh, here's one translation of a commentary on Mahan. The US benefited from what? Mahan's theories of sea power. Again, the United States pushes forward, moving forward at island chains, expanding that strategic depth out to sea and moving into the rank of the world's first powers, greatest powers. Again, if you want to be a world power, great power, the first rank, you need a navy of the first rank as well. Uh, again, if you want to have influence on the global stage, you'll have to have the powerful Navy as well. Um, sometimes when I speak, uh, my slides are put into uh, uh, the passages of Mahan, as you can see, translated into Chinese characters. Again, a wide common. Well, Robert Kaplan, the famous journalist, author, commentator on public affairs, writes, today the Chinese, they read their Mahan. The Chinese are the Mahanians now. Why? Because China's leaders want the, their country to move into the first rank of world powers. Mahan laid out a blueprint in their eyes for the rise of American power in the world at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Its leaders internalized Mahan's message. China, reading Mahan today, trying to internalize that to think about the future. So what does Mahan have to offer us today? Well, that stark reality of Mahan's works and the influence of sea power upon history, it's troubling for us. If Mahan were here today, what would he say? Well, he would say that while history doesn't repeat itself, there are certain patterns of history that put United States and China uh, on a path, a collision, where these two powers vying for world leadership, 
uh, are likely to clash. Again, that's the somber message that Mahan has for us today. Thank you very much. So my question is, and this is coming from an Army perspective, there's a lot of focus on uh, attendance at Army War College. Uh, you're pretty much not going to make full colonel if you don't attend Army War College or equivalent, and it's uh, a very competitive process to attend. And uh, at least from my perspective, uh, it seems that for the Navy, there seems to be a lot of this bias of still wanting officers to be line officers on ships as opposed to spending time in this academic setting. So I just, I'm just curious from, that was a big surprise growing up in the army culture where going to war college is like the pinnacle of your career. And then having that exactly as you described what Mahan faced a hundred years ago seems to be a somewhat of a reality today. And I was just wondering kind of what your thought process on that is. Well, it, it is certainly the case when you look at the Second World War, overwhelmingly the naval leaders that took part in the Atlantic and in the Pacific were all graduates and residents of the Naval War College where they did wargaming, but also they wrote major papers, thesis uh, on strategy and on what we would call operations. And so when you look at admirals like Admiral King and Admiral Stark that I highlighted, but also Nimitz Spruance. Spruance was here as a student, then a member of the faculty before going on to hold flag command. So the great leaders of the Second World War were great. Well, they studied here at the Naval War College. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, what we did here, uh, uh, there were flaws in the education that was here. Uh, if you look at some of the war games uh, that were uh, played here, there were wars between Britain and the United States uh, were played out here. Uh, and we had war plans, by the way, for fighting the British Empire. You know, I've highlighted the danger from Germany and the U.S. fighting each other. But um, there was also the possibility in these power transitions that Britain and the United States might have fought each other. The other thing is, in the interwar period, many thought we would never fight again in Europe. We did that in the First World War. We went over there. That's another song I could sing. Uh, but uh, uh, that war didn't seem to change anything. And so uh, the naval officers here were very much like the American public writ large, which is we will never fight another great war in Europe. So there's no need to think about how you fight submarines like we did in the First World War. So. So I would highlight the importance of the education here in the interwar period for creating the officer corps that were to lead the Navy uh, in the Second World War and triumph to get that victory at sea. So why do you think there's such a culture difference, I guess, today between sort of an army perspective and a Navy perspective when it goes yeah. to attending a war college? Yeah, I, and this culture that you talk about was something that was also evident in Mahan's time. When you read Mahan's influence of sea power upon history, he talks about how naval officers don't want to study history. What is it Henry Ford said? History is bunk. Uh, well, that, that was pretty much uh, an attitude that Navy officers had. Winston Churchill, when he took over as first Lord of the Admiralty, he wanted to um, make sure that British naval officers went to a war college and they didn't want to do that over there either. Uh, and uh, in a memorable passage, he says, the purpose of a war college is to take captains of ships and turn them into captains of war. Now, our, the army, uh, on the other hand, uh, is more connected to thinking about operations and strategy and studying from the past and what you can learn to apply to the future. Whereas navies tend to be more focused on the technology, ship handling, uh, so they are different cultures in that in that sense. I have found by the year through the years of teaching here that the officers who uh, often gravitate to Mahan are Air Force officers 
because as, again, it's a command of the aerospace commons. You need air superiority to win your wars. If you don't have air superiority, your ground and naval operations won't go anywhere. So that's a very Mahanian message, you know, command the maritime commons to be able to win on land. You know, Air Force officers uh, can take to, to Mahan. Mark, do you have any questions from Zoom? Are there any other questions here in the auditory? Yes, sir. So based on Mahan's book, uh, Influence of Sea Power, how do you think he would view uh, the, the industrial capacity that exists now in the United States for production of sea power, sea vessels and war? He would be very much concerned uh, about what he would see as an erosion of uh, an industrial base and the ability to produce uh, ships of all kinds, uh, weapons in general. I mean, that, that's part of the message of the influence of sea power upon history is, is that uh, the elements of sea power depend upon economic strength and in industrial age, you need to have industry. Uh, and so countries have to build up their industry, their technological base. So he would be in favor of supporting those things that uh, enhance your ability to build technologically sophisticated weapons, whether they be ships, aircraft, whatever. So there, there's an important connection there between that economic base and the ability to have military power. And that in peacetime, it's often not recognized how important that is. And then war happens and you try to build it up quickly. But what happens if the war is relatively short? <laughs> You're in trouble. Yeah, he, he would be very concerned about that, yes. Well, I think that concludes our discussion. Uh, if you'd like to uh, be out in the parking lot at the end of the event here, we're going to be selling John Maurer's Greatest Hits, uh, <laughs> where he will sing all of those songs he wanted to break into today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, let's hear it uh, for our wonderful speaker.